See, transformation is not just about us stopping sinning and being better people, but lasting transformation is a, is a spiritual consequence of beholding the glory of God. It's only when you really see him, when you really know him, when you really carve space for his presence, the transformation starts to take place. Amen, good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure as always to um, be teaching um, you guys. And I've just loved this series that we're journeying through on Exodus. Um, I have to say, initially, when I heard that we were going to be in Exodus for eight weeks, I thought, flip, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a journey. <laughs> no pun intended. But it's like, it's been good, hasn't it? Like, there are some absolute, I mean, it's just full of gold. And I think for me, like, what I've really enjoyed is, um, I'm being challenged about, is just how God is continuing to reveal himself to me. Like I keep finding out new things about him. I keep seeing a new aspect of him. I'm starting to understand how he works and what he does. And then when I think about that in my life and what my life looks like as I work out my faith on a day-to-day -day basis, this revelation of who God is is starting to shape and change how I think and how I feel and how I behave. And I think that that's what, that's what scripture does to us, isn't it? That's what we want. We want to be able to, to dive into scripture and, and read about not just other people's experiences, but we want to discover the truth of who God really is. I mean, this is his letter to us where he reveals to us who he is. And my heart and my prayer that as we look through some of these chapters that we've been reading through this week, and in particular, we're gonna be in chapter 32 of Exodus and looking at that, the story of what happened with the golden calf. My heart and my prayer is that you capture something of God's great love for you this morning, that you capture something of his infinitely holy character this morning, and that you realize that he is the one who is most deserving of all of our trust and our faith, that there is nothing else greater than him, there is no one else greater than him, and that in him we find everything that we need. God, this journey of Exodus, as I said, has been one of God revealing himself to his people. If we go back into Genesis and we, we think of the start of the journey of um, uh, God and Abraham and calling him out and giving him these promises. And one of the things that he says in, um, in Genesis 17 and verse three, um, God says to Abraham, he says, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations and I will make you very fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generation to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. God wants to be our God. He's not just some distant, removed character who sits in the clouds and peers down at us wanting to see what we're doing, but God wants to come near to us. Right from the very beginning, he has established this covenant with us, with his people, saying that I will be your God and you will be my people. Put me first and I'll put you first. If, if you put me first and you hide yourself in me, you will receive all the benefits of knowing me and of being in relationship with me. I will be your God. And so as we journey through Exodus, we see this revelation of God right from the very beginning when Moses meets him at the burning bush and God says, I am who I am, declaring his sovereignty and his power. And then as he journeys with, Mo as Moses journeys with God um, and we see the plagues unfolding as he comes against this power of Pharaoh who was like a God to his nation. 
And each of these different plagues representing different gods that the, that the Israelites worshipped. And God, every time saying, I am the one true God. I am bigger and I am more powerful and I am the only one who is worthy of all worship. And as the Israelites journey through the wilderness, he reveals more of himself to him. I am the God who rescues you. I am the God who provides for you. I am the God who protects you. I am the God who hears your cries and your grumblings. I am the God who answers your prayers. I am the God who goes before you, who is behind you, who surrounds you. I am the God who will never leave you. And then he gives them these beautiful laws and commandments which reveal more of who he is. And right at the very start, he says, you shall have no other God before me. Now, God's not afraid of us having other gods. He's not worried that if maybe we have another God, then he might lose his position of power and authority. And you know, oh, you know, he could be, um, his throne could be upset and that would be the end. And oh no, like that's it over for him. No, God's not afraid of competition. But what God knows is that in his sovereign power, in his divine authority, in the holiness of who he is, that there is nothing better than him, that he is complete in himself and we find completeness in him. And so when we have no other gods before him, when we put him front and center, when he is the only thing that consumes our gaze and our thoughts, then we find the best of ourselves in him and the best of everything that he's intended for all of creation, for all of time. He goes on in Exodus 34 and he reveals something else about himself. He says, after this whole incident with the golden calf, he says, do not worship any other god." For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And he's not jealous because, again, there's a fear in that jealous, but he's jealous because he wants us to have all of him and for him to have all of us. This beautiful relationship that he pursues with us. And it's in the midst of this context that Moses has gone up into the mountain to spend this time with God, receiving this more of a revelation of who God is as he unfolds all of the blueprints for the temple and the priesthood, that the, the Israelites find themselves in this moment where they decide to do something that is so contrary to everything that God has been leading them into. Let's read Exodus 32, verses one to six. When the people saw that Moses was so long and coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said to him, come make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. Aaron answered them, <clears throat> take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they handed him and made it into an idol, cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And then they said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day, the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Just a few chapters before, God has confirmed his covenant with his people. And his people respond to him saying, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. One um, scholar in one of their commentaries likened what happens here as almost like this, co this beautiful covenant that, that the people have entered into with God and then this fall into sin immediately afterwards is almost like someone committing adultery on their wedding night. You know, this beautiful covenant and promise that these people have entered into with a God who's promised everything to them. And then in this moment, something goes wrong. And this morning, I wanna think about three things that cause their idolatrous behavior and challenge us to think about what that means for us as we live out our relationship with God right here and right now. The first thing is this, 
One thing that caused their, their idolatrous, idolatrous behavior, number one, misplaced trust. Misplaced trust. Their impatience in that moment of wondering where Moses was and what God was doing shows a lack of trust, not just in their leader, but also in God. You know, they, they got to this point where they didn't trust God's timing anymore. They didn't trust that the promises that he had given to them would be fulfilled. They didn't understand what was taking so long. Moses was probably gone for about four weeks. And in fairness, when you're stuck in the middle of a wilderness and there's not really much else to do and your leaders disappeared, I mean, I think I probably be starting to think, like, what's going on here? But in this unknown time frame, the uncertainty of his return, the... The, the people decided to take matters into their own hands. In the absence of this visible leader, in this absence of a visible God who, who had been so close to them, they feel like they're on their own and they take matters into their own hands. I can imagine what they're thinking and what the whispers are saying through the camp. Maybe Moses isn't gonna come back. Maybe Moses did something really wrong and God's just like, that's it, he's like taking him out, he's not coming back again. Or maybe Moses and God have just decided to go on their own wee journey, you know, maybe they've changed their minds and they've realized that actually we're not worth it and they've got their own plans and their purposes. Maybe, maybe Moses fell asleep, maybe God's fallen asleep, maybe God's forgotten about us. Maybe he's changed his mind. He certainly isn't here. I don't feel like he's here. I, can't, I feel like I don't see him. I don't see this promise of him going before us. We're stuck in the same place. We haven't moved. So what's going on? And, and it's quite interesting because even in the midst of what they perceived as this absence of, who, of God and, and Moses, their leader, I often I wonder, like when they wake up in the morning and they saw the man on the ground, did they not realize like, that God was still there? Maybe just not in the way that they were expecting him that whenever the, the, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire made the, it was so visible to them, did they forget that that's where God was, that he wasn't restrained to this one place on the mountain, but actually that he was everywhere and he was with them? See, impatience develops when we aren't where we think we're supposed to be. Many times have you been standing in a queue um, and you're thinking like, like realistically, I should be at the top of this queue in what, five minutes? And then 10 minutes in, you're still twiddling your thumbs and you're pacing backwards and forwards and you start muttering and you get really annoyed and then you look for opportunities. To, you know, could I, is that person, maybe, maybe they're on their phone, could I just sneak past them? You know, you wanna take things into your own hands because you know that you need to be in a certain place and your timing is what you think it should be in that moment. Things aren't moving as quickly as what we expected them to. And what usually happens is we take matters into our own hands. We all know that, that familiar phrase, if you want a job done right, do it yourself, isn't that right? But misplaced trust demonstrates a misunderstanding of who God really is. A misplaced trust demonstrates a misunderstanding of who God is. Throughout this whole story, God has been revealing himself to his people. And if the people could really see who he was, if they had paid attention, if they really knew him, if they really understand who he was and what he was capable of, they would trust him, wouldn't they? But you and I know it's just not that easy all the time because there's so many things go on. There's so many battles that we, that we face. There's so many things which are so important to us. And what happens is that we don't trust God in those moments because we start to take things into our own hands. I'm one of these people who is like, just if you wanna get something done, just let me know what needs to be done. I've got a list and I'll work through it and I'll get to the end and I'll do it in the time and the way and the manner that I wanna get it done in. And so often it's not until there's a bump in the road or something goes wrong or something doesn't play out the way I expect it that I go, oh, flip God, maybe you could help me in this. Instead of starting off with him in the first place, finding out what his plan and purpose is, trusting his timing in the midst of it all. Jackie Hill Perry in her book, Holier Than Thou, says, puts it like this. If God is holy, then he can't sin. If God can't sin, then he can't sin against me. And if he can't sin against me, shouldn't that make him the most trustworthy being that there is? Not trusting the timing of what God was doing was the starting place for failure for the Israelite people. 
They weren't seeing him for who he truly was and therefore were not confident in his plans and purposes. You see, the truth is that for the Israelites, that where they had actually put their trust was in their leader and not God. They had seen the invisible God in action, but they wanted something that they could touch, something that they could feel, something that had a face. But you see, Moses wasn't holy. Moses wasn't God. And so the reality is that the doubt that they had of whether Moses would come back again was probably well-founded. Because he wasn't God, he could have let them down. And they're probably thinking about that time way back in the day. Do you remember when Moses tried to rescue them before and ended up killing somebody? I mean, Moses was human. He made mistakes. But if we try to understand God through our human constraints, we'll never completely trust him. If we try to understand the love he has from, for us through the love that we've experienced in our own world, We'll never really understand it. You know, if we try to understand what his provision looks like based on what's in our bank account or what our physical um, situation looks like, we'll never really grasp it. If we really, um, if we try to understand what, what healing looks like in the midst of sickness and despair and unanswered prayer, then we lose sight of who God really is. But you see, God is not like us. God does not behave like us. He is holy and therefore completely trustworthy. He will not lie. He will not break his promises. He will not change his mind and he will not hurt us. We have to stop judging God by our own human experience and we have to set him apart as the one who is holy, the one who is completely trustworthy and the one who is deserving of all of our worship. He is who he says he is. There is no shadow of turning in him. He is trustworthy and then worthy of complete surrender. The things that hold us back from giving everything to him is because we've misplaced our trust in him. He deserves everything, all of us, nothing held back. So that's misplaced trust. The second thing that we see going on here with the Israelite people is misplaced resources. Misplaced resources. The gold that was used to make the calf, where did it come from? We talked about this a bit last week. Charlotte um, was pointing this out. And we, we understand that, that, that whenever the Israelites left Egypt, they were able to plunder the Egyptians and they found favor with the Egyptians and they were able to fill their boots, fill everything. They had all the gold, all the silver, all the material, all the provision, everything that they could ever need, they were able to bring with them and they took it with them. We read that, you know, that whenever God is talking to Moses and he's unveiling this blueprint of the tabernacle, he says to Moses that you are to ask the people to give out of what has been given to them. What was never theirs in the first place, everything that they had was what was given to them. They were slaves. They didn't own anything. They had nothing. And yet they left full because of God's provision in that moment. And the intention was that this resource that had been given to them was to be used for the building of the temple, for the place in which God would dwell and inhabit. It was to be given back to God freely and sacrificially. But instead of the Israelite people waiting to find out what God's plan was for the resource that they had been given, they decided to build a God. They decided to use what God had given them to create something that wasn't him something that was outside of him. They had been giving something to steward in that moment. And their stewardship became wasted. One thing to know is that if God gives something to you, then he has a plan and a purpose for it. Nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God. Everything has plan and purpose. And the danger is that if we hold on to what God gives us for a purpose other than what he intended it for, we start to build a God with it. We start to think about what it can do for us rather than what God can do for us. We start to think about what benefit it can bring to us and what freedom it might afford us. All of the things that we should be looking for in God, 
we now place in resource. And these things aren't necessarily bad things. Money is not bad. Work is not bad. Relationships are not bad. Our possessions are not bad. But if we don't surrender the good things to God, the good things become God. And what happens is that we not only miss out, and um, we don't, that, that what happens is that we risk allowing that what God intended for good to become something that's used in a different way. What are you holding on to this morning? You see, we also risk missing out on the fullness of his provision for us. We see, God wants us to prosper. God wants us to live in bounty. He wants us to live in fullness and in wholeness. And when we hold back what we think we need or what we just want, then that's all we have. But when we give, there is something about what happens in the upside down kingdom of God that means that we actually end up with more than what we had in the first place. God teaches us, it's clearly taught through the whole of scripture that when we give and release what we have, we receive in abundance. Proverbs 3 and verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim with good wine. Luke 6 and 38, Jesus says, give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be poured into your lap. Everything that we have is a gift from God. It's not ours to hold on to. And so what we do with it is to bring God honor and glory. It's to discover what are the divine purposes that you have in the things that I have? What is the divine purpose that God has in the stuff that he's given us? And for us to release it back to him and say, do what you will with it. And the beautiful thing in that transaction is that we become blessed, that we have more than enough and we live in the fullness and the provision of what he has for us. Everything that we have is a gift from God and what he is calling us to do is be good stewards of everything that we have. Not to take it like the Israelites did and be fearful of maybe what was going on in the circumstances around them and turn it into something that met their needs in that very small moment but yet created this distance between them and God. The third thing that we see going on here, we've seen misplaced trust, misplaced resources, and the third thing is misplaced worship. See, the Israelites really did want to worship God. They actually did believe that, you know, that, that they were worshiping God in this moment. But what happened was that it wasn't the God of, that we know, but it was a God that they had created to represent him. They wanted God to fit into their idea of what he should be. And so they create something that's tangible, something that they can feel and that they can touch. We all know um, as Christians how difficult it is to place your trust in something that you cannot see. Some, something that feels so, so removed and so distant from us. But yet God promises us that in his fullness, in, in his invisibleness is also his fullness. But yet the Israelites needed something to touch. They needed something to hold on to. And so they made a God that they can see. The created became the creator in that moment and they shaped God into their liking to fit their mold, their expectations, their requirements, their desires and in doing so have shrunk God into their limitations and expectations. And don't we just do exactly the same? I think sometimes when we read passages like this and we think of idolatry, we think of things that we've set in a greater position than God. We think of other religions that have physical idols that they bow down and worship. We think of our possessions and the things that we own, or we think of money, or we think of power, and we think that these are the things that actually get in our way. But actually, the, the biggest thing, the, the biggest stumbling block and the biggest idol that we have comes from deep inside of ourselves. 
because there's something inside of us that wants to be in control. There's something inside of us that wants to know exactly what's happening and how it's all gonna work out. There's something inside of us that has an agenda and has a plan and has a purpose and wants God to fit inside of it instead of allowing us to step into the fullness of what he has. We place constraints and restrictions and limitations on God every single day. The way that we pray and what we pray for, the way that we go about our lives, or the conversations that we have with others. And we get so frustrated when God doesn't answer our prayers the way we expect him to. We get so frustrated whenever God doesn't move in the way that we want him to. We get so frustrated that when our life involves a little bit of sacrifice or some compromise that wasn't part of our plan or even, dare I say, it's some suffering, The Israelites had this false perception of who the true God was. I don't think that they were trying to replace God with another God. I think that they had just got mixed up and misunderstood who God was. This calf was supposed to represent God and they still wanted to worship him, but on their terms. They were sincere in their worship, but they were sincerely wrong. They tried to do good things and right things, but for the completely wrong reasons. From the outside looking in, it looked good. Verse five says, you know, they built an altar. That's a good thing to build an altar. It says that they they had a festival to the Lord. That's a good thing, having a festival to God. It says that they rose early the next morning and they sacrificed. They brought burnt offerings and they brought fellowship offerings. Those were good things to do. And afterwards they sat down and they had this beautiful meal, a covenant meal together, which was a good thing. But it was completely misplaced because they weren't doing it for God. They were doing it for the God that they had created, this God that they had made out of gold. And we see the key thing in this at the very end when it says that they got up to indulge in revelry. Revelry is not worship. Revelry, when you look at this word in the, in the Hebrew, means to laugh at in merriment, to mock or to scorn, to make a sport of, to play along with. And I wonder, is that what our worship has become? Is it just something that we participate in? Do we just show up on a Sunday because it's the right thing to do? You know, this is worship when we meet together and we put God at the center of what we do, but it's not just this on a Sunday. It's not just gathering together. It's not just a catchy song that makes our heart race in a moment. Our worship is seen in who we are and how we live. It's an overflow of this revelation that we have when we come and draw near to God. It's an overflow of our understanding of who he is. Jesus, when he met the woman at the well, said to her, yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers that the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit, there's no, there's no tangible thing to feel. There's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to touch. But spirit is whenever our deep connects with the deep of the Father. When we see and we get a revelation of who he is, when it changes us from the inside out and it becomes an overflow in who we are and how we behave and what we do with all the stuff that we have. Paul says in Romans, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Giving it all to him, everything that we have, not just our physical stuff, but us, everything that we are, all of the things that we carry, all of the the restraints that hold us in place, all of the expectations placed on us, everything given over to him in complete surrender, allowing us and our spirit to connect with him in a way that completely transforms us. 
See, we were created to be image bearers, to be the ones who represent God here on earth, for people to look at us and to see something of him, of God in us. We're not called to be image makers. That's not our job. God is better than every good thing that there is. And our choice is, do we make God ruler of our life, completely surrendering everything to him, or do we make good things God of our life? See, all of us are prone to worshiping a God of our own making, whether it's something physical or whether it's something within ourselves. And so that's why God commands, you're to have no other God before me because he knows that we need to worship him and him alone, that in him alone we find the fullness of everything he has for us and we find ourselves in him. And we know that, that sin is the root of the problem here. We know that we are sinful, fallen people, but we also know, as, as David so beautifully led us through, that we have a savior, one who came, like Moses mediated on behalf of the people before God and, and saw their salvation in that moment, that we have a mediator who mediates on behalf of us, that, 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 that this story of Moses points us towards one who, who was to come and who has come, Jesus Christ, who pays the price for all of our sin and our shame. And we know that we step into a life of complete freedom, that where the Israelites made this journey of freedom, that we get to stand in complete freedom today because of the journey that Jesus made from heaven to earth to the cross, rose again, and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. And so we get to live in complete freedom. But you and I know that that, that, that that tussle is real, that there's something inside of us that even though no matter how hard we want to do the right thing, no matter how hard we want to turn away from our sin, no matter how hard it is to put God right at front and center all of the time, that there's still a desire inside of us that wants that. And I think we see in Moses here um, a glimpse of the answer to this problem. You see, I can tell you this morning, do this, do this, do this, and then everything will be okay. Put down your idols, repent of your sins, you know, put some spiritual practices in place that help you to, to, to overcome the flesh. But actually what Moses shows us is that the solution is found in this wholehearted pursuit of God's presence. You see, transformation is not just about us stopping sinning and being better people but lasting transformation is a, is a spiritual consequence of beholding the glory of God. It's only when you really see him, when you really know him, when you really carve space for his presence, the transformation starts to take place. It's only when we hide ourselves away and we give everything to him that we start to see him working in us and through us. Exodus 33. Just come and I'm just gonna bring this all to a close with just reading some of this scripture and a few thoughts on it. So if the band wanna come up. Exodus 33 and verse 12, Moses says to the Lord, you have been telling me, lead these people but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. That needs to be the cry of our hearts this morning, CFC East. We need to come to God. He's told us that he knows us by name. We know that we have found favor with him. And so this morning, Lord, if you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. And the Lord replies, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses says to him, if your present does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and your people unless you go with us? What else distinguishes me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? 
And the Lord says to Moses, I will do the very thing that you've asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. And Moses says, now show me your glory. Now show me your glory. And the Lord says, I will cause all of my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. How much do you really wanna know him this morning? What sacrifices are you willing to make in order to pursue the fullness of everything that he is? What misplaced trust or resources or worship needs to be brought back into line with everything that God planned and purposed for those things? I don't know about you, but I don't want anything anything in my life to stop me from stepping into the fullness of what God has for me. I don't wanna miss out on one iota of his blessing. I don't wanna miss out on one, um, one tiny part of the beautiful story that he's written for, you, for me. I wanna be able to step into the fullness of everything that he said about me, everything that he's um, spoken over me. I wanna know that and its fullness in my life. I want to be a force to be reckoned with. I want to be someone who displays the glory of God. I want to be an image bearer for him in this world. I want people to look at me and see Christ in me. Not for my fame or for my glory, but because I want people to know him because he's good and because he's compassionate and because he's kind. And so this morning, as we just take a moment to pray and respond, Holy Spirit, will you reveal to us what's misplaced and help us to put it back into place? Lord, show us who you are this morning. Keep revealing yourself to us and fill us with a hunger and a desire that wants to pursue you and you alone. Lord, forgive us for the things that we hold on to, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And Lord, we just surrender them to you today. Take it all, Lord. Take all of who I am and all that I have for your glory. Amen.